Hello, this is Jeremiah, host and producer of the Stereoactive Movie Club podcast, with a quick note before the show begins. This episode was actually recorded way back in October of 2021. Mia and I had a baby in the fall, and due to that, some health concerns leading up to the birth, and now actually being parents of a lovely little one, we had to unceremoniously put the podcast on hold for a while. We hope you'll bear with us as we work toward getting back on track with the show in the coming weeks and months, though. Now... Here's the episode. Welcome to the Stereoactive Movie Club. My name is Jeremiah, and I am here with Alicia, Laura, and Stephen. Unfortunately, Mia isn't able to join us for this episode. And we are going to be talking about the 1939 film, The Rules of the Game, directed by Jean Renoir. But before we go on, let's hear from everyone about what movies they've watched since the last time we recorded. Steven, how about you? I watched Jason and the Argonauts, uh, that movie from 1963. It was about the quest for the Golden Fleece, which I really did enjoy it. They, that was the movie where they had a lot of stop motion just from a technical achievement as a special effect. Mm-hmm. And it was a movie where you might have seen clips of it where the, the people are fighting um, like skeletons with swords. Or, yeah. You know, it, it, was, it was really well done for 1963. It was pretty impressive. So Is that Ray uh, Harryhausen who did that, I think? I think so. The, the effects, the- at least. Yeah, um, they did a little like precursor or whatever, and they were talking about it before the movie. It's on um, the Turner Classic Movies, I think, um, or ACM, one of those. Um, and then the second movie I saw was because it was Halloween, I watched Sorority Row, which was made in 2009. And it actually, I enjoyed it a lot more than I should have, I think. I laughed a lot more than I expected to laugh at it. And then the deaths were really creative. So um, it was it was actually better than I expected. I had no expectations when I saw it. So it was it was enjoyable for a Halloween movie. Nice. Uh, well, I saw Dune, the new Dune. I thought it was visually impressive. I thought the world building was impressive. I'm not sure how I feel about the storytelling. I mean, the movie literally ends with them saying this is the beginning, which is a little frustrating, but like, it's sort of one of those things where I'm willing to hold my fire on it until I see the next one and see if it comes together like a, a, you know it, it could be part of a bigger thing that pays off uh, a la marvel or other things like that but until then uh jerry's out i also saw they live again the john carpenter movie uh which continues to resonate through the ages and will forever i guess until capitalism dies um and i saw that in a the theater really mm. yeah nice was um, great. then uh, rewatched for the millionth time Beginners, which is one of my comfort movies. Um, and uh, then I also saw his uh, Mike Mills's new movie in a sneak preview at the Austin Film Society, Come On, Come On, with Joaquin Phoenix and Gabby Hoffman. And uh, it was it was pretty good. Watching those two films back to back made me realize like how nobody, I think, working today in movies is maybe as good as he is at like telling a heartfelt earnest story without it being like cloying and annoying it's actually comes across in the way it's intended and i i really like him that's a really nice way to put it i think um even though i have had problems with some of his recent films i think that i couldn't argue with what you just said fair enough and i can argue with it anything (laughs) that's how i know i really got one over when when laura's (laughs) like i can't even argue with that uh alicia how about you Um, I watched the original Dune, the David Lynch Dune this week. Never seen it before and never read any of the books or anything. Um, And I didn't, you know, I was expecting to like find it really boring or, you know, (laughs) S-H-I-T-T-Y. But I actually did it. I thought it was okay. (laughs) You just got PG now. Mm -hmm. Sorry. (laughs) When did that happen? I don't remember. Hey, my parents might be listening. I don't know. Uh, No, no. I. But I don't know. It was okay. Like I, I understood everything that was going on. Like I, I, I've heard a lot of people find it difficult to follow the plot, but I didn't find it difficult. And I just thought, you know, it's it wasn't ready to be made. It didn't. They didn't have the techno the technology to do. The, the type of special effects that it seems like the story probably needs. And there was a lot of really, there was a lot of boring 
sequences but overall I didn't hate it or anything and I found the sting stuff really entertaining (laughs) (laughs) he's like half naked mostly yeah Mm-hmm. My and, main um, thing with that movie is I think it's in- impossible to follow a movie when you can't keep your eyes open because you're asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I never got through it, Jeremiah, because I, I yeah, think I same. might have mentioned that. I, I was I, like, I, my eyes kept closing yeah, every time I've I I've never seen that it. full movie because it's so boring I, I fall asleep during it. Uh, and Laura, how about you? What have you been watching? I rewatched Leon the Professional, um, the mm. 1994 Luc Besson film. Mostly because, I mean, I remember just absolutely loving it and loving Luke Bouchon, but I wanted to revisit it and see how I felt about it. And, um, and it made me very uncomfortable um, mm. in many ways. And um, it's still it's still such an enjoyable film. Mm-hmm. And, and there are some very specific choices that you watch the director make to sexualize this 12-year-old girl. And um, it's just very confusing and um, unsettling experience. Even Gary Oldman's role, it's just, you eat him up, you love it. And it's, he's just a sociopathic, Mm -hmm. like psychotic murderer killed children, you know, like it's just, Mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I, I'm not eloquent about it, but I, I felt like I wanted to revisit it. So that's what I did this week. Mm-hmm. I saw that movie when I went to Italy um, when I was in college, and it was Leon, I think, and I, that's mm-hmm. the only time I've ever actually seen it. So I, I'm sure that I'd love to rewatch it just to see if I feel the same way because it was very visual. I remembered because um, my mm-hmm. Italian wasn't that great, so <laughs> I, mean, I had to depend more on what I was seeing on the screen than the language. Yeah. So there's some amazing fishbowl shots, and just mm-hmm. the way they navigate in New York City tight space mm-hmm. is really interesting and made it so beautiful and the soundtrack was really cool and yeah it was it was a lot to i'm still wrapping my head around it Mm -hmm. all right well for those who may not have listened to the show before this is a podcast where the five of us are discussing movies that have appeared on sight and sound magazine's poll of the greatest movies ever made which comes out every 10 years the next poll will be out in 2022 so we're basically using that as our prompt to watch some classic movies ahead of it And again, this time we are talking about the rules of the game. But before we get into the history and background of the movie, uh, what did each of us know about it going into this viewing? Who had seen it before? And if you hadn't, what were you expecting, if anything? And since I was the one who picked this one, I guess I'll start us off and explain why I chose it. Basically, this is one of the two films in the top five of the 2012 list that we hadn't watched yet. So that was one of the big reasons I picked it. And it's been in the top five of this poll every time since 1962, which is another reason I wanted to pick it. I did see it years ago when I was in college. Didn't remember very much of it. I did remember that I don't think I got it at the time. I I sort of came away from it uh, as a, 20 or probably 18 or 19 year old just sort of wondering what the fuss was about but it was like one of those movies that we'd see clips of in classes and stuff and it was just kind of drilled into you that it was important and I you know kind of felt like I never connected with the why of that so that's where I was coming at with it and uh, Laura how about you I knew absolutely nothing about this film I knew it was going to be in black and white and it was going to be dusty (laughs) <laughs> and uh i i was i had a lot of trepidation about it i was like uh before we watched it so i just it's not like one of those um things we all people talk about even though it's been in this poll for so many every time it's i you know i'm a movie nerd and i'm a, you know i'll argue with people online about stuff and <laughs> and this movie just doesn't really come up much or hasn't in my um space so. right and Stephen, what about you um i had never heard of this movie before at all so it was a complete uh surprise to me to watch it um so yeah i i had no expectations going into it okay and alicia i'd also never heard of it before i i like briefly googled it when i was trying to decide which film i wanted to pick this round so i knew it was a french film that was supposed to be like a comedy of manners or some type of social commentary, but that's all I really knew. 
Okay, uh, let's go ahead and take a break. We'll be back in a moment. And welcome back. So as I've often done on the show, I'm going to read from an entry in the Ultimate Encyclopedia of the Movies, which I got when I was in high school and first getting into movies. As always, the parts that may be more subjective aren't for me personally, but perhaps we can delve into those things as we get into our group discussion. The great pre-war French satirical comedy of manners, The Rules of the Game, is widely regarded as Jean Renoir's masterpiece, marking its move away from naturalism towards a more classical and poetic style. It boasts a deceptively simple story about a count organizing a shooting party for his friends, which becomes the setting for a complex of romantic intrigues. Renoir took this by no means original setup, added a Beaumarchais-style subplot in which the servants aped the behavior of so-called betters, and created a bleakly pessimistic but often hilarious comedy of social mores, which dissects the games people play in their relationships, set against a society riven by class distinctions. As the unblinking eye of his camera records the intrigues, social rivalries, and foibles of the characters, the mood switches daringly from comedy to tragedy, realism to fantasy, melodrama to farce. Renoir himself also acted in the film, turning in a beautiful performance as the well-meaning muddler Octave. Ironically, the film proved one of Renoir's greatest commercial failures, it was cut drastically and not seen again in its entirety until 1956, after careful restoration. Again, that was an entry in the ultimate encyclopedia of the movies. The Rules of the Game was the most expensive film ever made in France at the time of its production and came on the heels of a series of successful films that had made Renoir one of the top French directors. After initial preview screenings that began in June of 1939 and a premiere in July that met with low box office and mixed reviews, a series of edits eventually whittled the film down from its 113-minute runtime to 85 minutes. Many of the edits excise Renoir's own performance, resulting in a much less complex and integral character. By October, the film was banned in France for being, quote, depressing, morbid, immoral, and having an undesirable influence over the young, end quote. A successful 1956 attempt at restoration led to the discovery of negatives and other prints and audio for the film that had been thought lost during World War II. Eventually, with advice from Renoir, a 106-minute cut was assembled that largely restored what had been cut after the film's post-release failure. The restoration was screened for Renoir in 1959 and reportedly left the director in tears. It then premiered at the 1959 Venice Film Festival to much praise. It's this restored version of the film that most people have seen and which has influenced countless filmmakers since then. Director Satyat Ray whose film Pather Panchali will be watching for an upcoming episode, said of the rules of the game, It is a film that doesn't wear its innovations on its sleeve. Humanist, classical, avant-garde, contemporary, I defy anyone to give it a label. This is the kind of innovation that appeals to me. End quote. To give a sense of what was popular in the United States in 1939, as the rules of the game was first released in France, Gone with the Wind was both the far and away top grossing film of the year and also the big winner at the Academy Awards. For our purposes, this is the only film that's been in the top 10 of Sight and Sound's critics poll every single time since it began in 1952, when it debuted at number 10, even before its restoration. It then fluctuated between number 2 and number 3 from 1962 to 2002 and was then at number 4 in 2012. Additionally, it was on the director's poll in 2002 at number 9. In the 2012 polling, 100 critics had the film on their list, and 17 directors, including Olivier Assayas, Lawrence Kasdan, Steve McQueen, and Paul Schrader. All right, so again, since this was my pick, I'll start us off with my thoughts on the film and whether it met my expectations or lived up to my memory of it. And I guess I'll basically say I definitely think that I appreciated it more this time. I'm still not sure I fully connect with it in the way that the many, many critics and film directors who voted for it 
in 2012 and all the previous polls by Sight and Sound do. I think I can understand it more intellectually than maybe emotionally in some ways. Like I, I get it. Like there are certain things about the, the, the form of the storytelling, the craft of the filmmaking that are um, innovative, but they are almost invisible in a way to a modern eye, I think, which is something I want to kind of come back to. Um, but I did enjoy it. I do think it's an entertaining story. And I think I enjoyed it just as a story more probably today than I did in college, uh, which is probably not surprising. So Stephen, how about you? What did you think? And did it live up to the the small, perhaps, expectations you may have had not knowing much about the movie at all? I did actually really like this movie a lot. And I think, um, and I keep beating a dead horse about this, but I feel like movies like this, you need to watch multiple times in order to kind of understand what was happening with it. For, when I watched it the first time, I did enjoy the story, but the second time I watched it, I got so much more out of it. And it felt like the characters are much more complex than I gave them credit for. And I think in some ways that the movie was, um, the, the characters all seem very similar to each other. So it was kind of hard to parse who they were sometimes, mm -hmm. but they did seem to like carry the same kinds of emotions or they struggled a lot in their own way. So I was able to kind of identify with them and they were all very different yet the same. So it was kind of an interesting thing to watch, I think. And, and I also struggled with it a little bit just because there wasn't a clear protagonist and maybe that's why, because everybody was kind of struggling at the same time. Um, and it's also, I felt like it was one of those movies that you would study in a film school because there was so much going on with it. And you can find so much in these movies as you keep watching them. So overall, I, I thought it was worth watching and I did enjoy it. And I feel like I should watch it like a dozen more times so I can get everything. Right. And uh, Laura, what about you? I thought it was very charming, um, very surprisingly um, enjoyable. It's so it was so layered as an ensemble cast, and it it just reminded me so much of Gosford Park. Um, <laughs> I wonder how I would have felt about the film if I had seen it before Gosford Park, but I haven't. And it was obvious that was obviously a this movie was obviously a huge inspiration for Altman mm -hmm. and um, his filmmaking. And yeah, I, I mean, I, I thought it was really, really good. And I, I didn't know that Renoir acted in the film um, until after, which, and I thought his performance was one of the most poignant and, and um, yeah, it was, it was cool, man. <laughs> right. And Alicia, what about you? Uh, I hated this movie. <laughs> I hated it a lot, sorry. <laughs> Like I, I went back and watched it with the commentary even because I was just like, I know I'm missing something. And uh, even with the commentary, it did make me appreciate it and understand it a little bit better. But I just was like, as an American viewer in 2021, I how would I have any context for understanding <laughs> what the rules are that anyone's supposed to be following it's I get that they're supposed to be a few characters that are insiders and a few characters that are outsiders and that's great that's somewhat helpful but I still was like I still don't know who's following the rules when and who's breaking the rules when and it just never I just never connect with it and I have I've not to the laundry list but I wrote out a whole bunch of reasons while I was watching it and wrote a whole bunch of things I didn't like and maybe we'll cover some of those but I didn't like this movie sorry okay I'm actually <laughs> shocked by that I thought of all of us you would probably be the one who liked it the most um <laughs> I don't know why I thought that I because I, I think because you like British shows and stuff. And I know this is French, but like there's a whole layer of aristocracy and class to it that I, I think of as similar to that. And, the, and you know, like the whole Gosford Park of it all, like Laura was saying, I, I definitely upstairs, think... downstairs stuff. Yeah, exactly. I so yeah, I, yeah. I kind of thought you would like this movie. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. <laughs> so was the commentary you listened to, was it the Peter Bogdanovich commentary? 
I don't think so. I don't okay. know. I, it was whatever was on criteria. Yeah, I think that's Peter Bogdanovich. I started to mm-hmm. listen to that and just was like, this is so dense and I don't have time for this mm-hmm. right now. I just finished watching mm-hmm. this movie and other things to do. But it seemed very interesting. Yeah. Like, wh- I'm curious, what were your biggest couple of takeaways for, from listening to that commentary? The commentary? After, yeah, after not well, enjoying the movie the first go around without it. I mean, he definitely, whoever's doing it, if it is Bogdanovich, whoever, whoever's doing it, definitely like um brings out a lot of the points out a lot of the emotional complexity that's going on that I wasn't able to like understand and maybe it's a language barrier or maybe just the style of acting I wasn't connecting with or something I, I'm not sure um and you know they talked about um some of the cinematography and they talked about they talk, he really did talk a lot about actually like what the what rules were being broken and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So after the commentary, I did under like I said, I did understand it better and appreciate it a little bit more. But I just felt like I I still didn't like ha- come away with a love for it or or even really. I kind of wondered if the point was that I'm supposed to dislike all these characters. I think that is kind of the point in the end. It's it's it is kind of like a takedown of of these of this class and these types of attitudes and this frivolousness that was happening right on the eve of world war ii Mm -hmm. but i also thought it didn't really go far enough in that direction it was like too subtle as a social commentary for me and too subtle as like a commentary on and not subtle enough in other ways and not subtle enough to point out what was actually wrong i don't know (laughs) if that makes any sense (laughs) I don't know. Um, I think a good a good reason for that, or not a good reason, but it made me think of near the end of the movie where they were having that shootout with all the characters, and it didn't seem to phase a lot of the people in there. So a lot of the stuff that was in there was very even. So it was kind of hard to like have any kind of emotional investment because so much was going on, and it was all at the same kind of tempo. Yeah. So you couldn't really connect with like, oh, this relationship it really is going to be powered by something. It was sort of like even. Christine near the end when she was like, I'm in love with, um, what's the name, Andre? And then all of a sudden he's in love with uh, the other person. And it seemed like it was the same emotions. So yeah. I feel like for some reason, yeah, it was hard to connect with that, I think. Yeah, she was all over the place. And I didn't really, I wasn't sure if she really loved anybody or if she was just like trying to get out of this marriage or this world that she didn't like being in. I found her very uncharismatic as an actor. I didn't understand why anyone love was in love with her. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. Sorry, Laura. Laura. I think it, it's it's about the whims of the rich, the rich, and um, she was the classic example of that as this foreigner in in France. And and the more I, there is a lot of underlying stuff about um, the impending war and what's coming, and and there's lots of conversations and it, yeah. I, I I I thought it was. Yes, she was all over the place. Yes, she fell in love with anybody at <laughs> in a moment's notice, and you didn't really know what the deal was. But I didn't know if you were supposed to as much as when you're in that level of society. That's just how you behaved then. Yeah. I, mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. know. I just sort exactly. of rolled with it. Yeah, I agree with you. I thought it was that's kind of part of the satire of it is that it's about how these people don't have necessarily hard and fast feelings about anything they're just kind of whatever floats their boat in the moment and i think that even extends maybe to what steven was talking about of like the sort of evenness or or however you described it of the action of like no one being phased by fucking gunfire in this house (laughs) you know like it it's just whatever who cares it's just entertainment to them they even say like they thought it was just like part of the spectacle Mm -hmm. because they were at this masquerade party with the performance going on which i mean maybe they're trying to make a statement here about the blurring of the lines between reality and and uh frivolous play or something i don't know but anyway anybody else (laughs) i was just say i couldn't i can see the gunfire and them not paying attention or them not being really faced by the violence the hunting the um the death of the obviously the death of Andre, but also what there's like a conversation that one of the one or two of the men are having 
at the end of the hunting scene where he's like, oh yeah, remember that guy that shot himself in the leg? Right. <laughs> yeah. Took him 20 minutes to die. <laughs> yeah. And they're just like, that I can see as like an interesting sort of, I don't, I don't think foreshadowing is the word, but an interesting like take on how people didn't seem to think didn't seem to want to take the world around them seriously or didn't have any emotional mm-hmm. investment in, in anyone. And that was sort of something that was, that they were, that was sort of the same way they were treating the, uh, the impending war. So I, mm-hmm. I appreciated that aspect of it. I just think that like when, when there's a movie where you, <laughs> or any TV show or book or anything where there's no character that you really like and you really ro- are rooting for, mm-hmm. A lot of people appreciate that and and I get it, but I don't like that. I, I mm-hmm. have a really hard time with that. So I think Laura said that she enjoyed Renoir's performance as Octave, right? Um, mm-hmm. I did too. So I, I guess mm-hmm. I'm not saying he's like the hero of the movie or anything. I don't think he's quite that. He's sort of like this intermittent court jester or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. I like him as a character. I'm, yeah. You didn't enjoy his his performance or his character in the in the film either alicia um i i probably disliked him the least <laughs> <laughs> wow okay wow. but i mean i i i just didn't i i don't know i just didn't connect i just didn't like it didn't like it hmm. i felt like he was just like an outsider and maybe that's why he was kind of freer to act like he mm-hmm. could um so that's why i think he sort of had so many good relationships with the people that were around right. um, and even at the end it showed like he was he'd rather preserve the friendship than to go after what he really wanted right. and yeah. that seemed to be a good theme for the movie in and of itself it seemed like the friendships with people were much stronger than the actual like love relationships right yeah, and I mean, that seemed to be a theme from the beginning where they talk about how a, a man and a woman can't be friends or something like that. Um, I don't mm-hmm. remember how they phrase it, but something that's about the gist wings. Of it. Something yeah. not supposed to have wings, having wings. Yeah. A pig. <laughs> also, in, in terms of characters that you like or not, um, I, I actually ended up really liking The Count by the end of the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, at, at the start, I was like, oh, this fucking guy, this is annoying. But. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. As as it went on, like he just he was just fun to watch. I thought on screen. Agree. I thought, I and his weird little obsession with collecting musical, like, like automatons or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and Marceau was interesting to me. Just this, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he, I liked it, all of the characters. Even he's if very broad. Really hated Marceau. I hated is very Marceau. Broad. <laughs> hated <laughs> Marceau. <laughs> hated him i think maybe he's what tanked the whole movie for yeah. me yeah wow. he, he kind of seems like he's coming out of like faulty towers or something yeah, yeah. and it's he's not even bad. i don't even think his physical comedy is very good like when you compare it to the physical comedy of buster keaton and charlie chaplin at the time i just didn't even think it was like in the ball in the same ballpark sure. i thought it was way too way too obvious i don't know it didn't look when he when he knocked into the table and knocks the tray over and alerted the husband to his presence. It didn't look accidental. It looked like he did it on purpose. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh no, I just didn't like it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, I, I feel like a sometimes theme that we've had through the podcast is is some of these movies that are sort of a template for things that came later in a way um, that it can be mm-hmm. hard to like appreciate them after mm-hmm. watching the things that came later. So do you think this is at all a case of that for you, Alicia? Where, like, I don't know what your thoughts are on Gosford Park or Downton Abbey, uh, a million other things. Like, I even saw people comparing the big chill to this. Mm. If it's like everyone gathers together in a house and the truth comes out sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So are do you think there's an element of that to it blocking your enjoyment of the film fully? Yeah, I mean, to- that could totally be that I could totally be that I've seen it done in a way that I consider better or I, I, I don't, I really do. I was surprised too, that I didn't like it because I really do like Gosford Park. I watched most of Downton Abbey. Um, I like the big chill, you know, like I like things like that, but I feel like those instances, there's at least one person that you can kind of mm-hmm. grasp onto. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't, I didn't, there was no one in this that I, I mean, the the niece was sweet, but she's not in it enough for you to really 
care about her on on any sort of real like level do you mean like there's no moral compass to the film I guess and I get that that's sort of the point but Mm -hmm. I just don't particularly enjoy that type of storytelling I could get why that would be reeling on some level yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it's funny because usually I'm on your side, Alicia. I need someone to root for. <laughs> no, it, it's just the way that I am when I watch yeah. something. Like it's always sunny in Philadelphia. I can't stand it because I don't like any <laughs> any character, and there's nobody normal on that show that I can kind of hang oh, my see, head I on. See, I do like that show. I think I think Charlie's <laughs> the moral compass of that show, even though he's horrible. But anyway, yeah. But yeah, but that's how it. But it, it was the reverse in this movie. I kind of liked how everybody in the movie just came with their own struggle, and that mm-hmm. they weren't perfect people, and you. Felt like oh they're gonna learn something at the end which i don't know if anybody really did but sort of like it was more about the journey for me than it was about the end result so i i felt like it was kind of it was just enjoyable to watch even though i wasn't sure if i liked any of the characters mm-hmm. I've, i felt compassion for them even if I, and mm. empathy, even if i didn't necessarily mm-hmm like them or think their motivations were pure right. yeah i like how you said that that's true that's what i felt too well, we touched on how the the movie is sort of like a uh, it it takes place like just before the dawn of World War II, um, and it's often discussed as a portrayal of that time. So, does that context? I guess it sounds like it did come through naturally to everybody to some degree. Is that true? Or if not, did reflecting on it after the fact and like perhaps reading about that context or listening to commentary, how did that affect your thoughts on it? The kitchen scene where they're talking about Jews, essentially, yeah. you know, and how they're approaching that is is pretty telling of, of the context of the time. And the count is Jewish, which I think the is, count yeah. is Jewish, but they yeah. but they say but he's a gentleman, right? Kind right. Of, it was, mm-hmm. it was uh, that was very interesting, or right. how she was this cold Austrian Christine kind of, but yet too affectionate and when they were doing the performance and they had those beards and hats and what what were they trying to emulate you know I I think there was just so much sprinkled throughout of of um yeah yeah I I think I had read that um Christine the actress you know since she was really Austrian I guess she had an she had an accent so like, I, I feel like if I had been able to speak French and been able to discern that, that was probably one of the other things that would have kind of mm-hmm. come up. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they do tell us that pretty heavily at the beginning, but I, I agree mm-hmm. that like when you hear a, mm-hmm. a, a tell of that, like throughout something, it, mm-hmm. it definitely has more of an effect rather than just being told about it, but actually witnessing it as well. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that for me, that's something I didn't grasp the first time I saw it or didn't understand fully. And I feel like I'm, you know, older, hopefully wiser, probably not as wise as I should be. But, uh, you know, like I've read more in my life and like understand history better than I did uh, 20 years ago. And I, I, I think I can appreciate it as sort of like this time stamp of a time and place and the issues that were a play in that society and how it kind of fed into this bigger thing that blew up and engulfed the world. Like it's, it's kind of funny to attach this on the surface, seemingly like kind of unserious farce to like something so tragically big and, you know, bad. So, uh, yeah, but, I think it's there. I just kept thinking about how within weeks they'll all every single character will be dead. Right. <laughs> mm. Wow. Like, oh, God, completely <laughs> invaded. Didn't anybody else think that way? <laughs> I thought of the course like their whole world and their country and everything would be torn to, you know, torn asunder. Mm-hmm. But um I wasn't picturing them all dead or anything. Um but <laughs> I wonder if a lot of stuff got put onto this later. Do you know what I mean? Like after the war, sure. I think I think it was a lot easier to read and in, read into things. I don't necessarily know that this sort of mildly or not so mildly anti-Semitic stuff. I don't know that they were fully aware how 
that, that that was like of what was actually going on in some of these places and how that would actually play into what happened in World War II. I don't know how aware they were of what was happening to Jewish people in concentration. I obviously I know they were being ghettoized and I'm sure that that was like known, but I don't know how much they knew about how far that was going to go. And right. I think a lot of things that happened later, uh, you know, the, a lot of knowledge that came later kind of got put on, put onto this. Sure. Uh, but, but I do think it's telling that Renoir thought he was making just like this kind of silly movie, or at least to hear him tell it. I have my doubts to some degree mm -hmm. about how true his him saying that is. But the movie got banned in France. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like mm -hmm. it, it wasn't considered just this like mild farce. It, it, it had bite to it that people interpreted at the time, even before the war. I mean, it was it was only out for what was it like? not even half a year before it got banned in France. Yeah, I think I don't, I think I would be curious to know the full reasoning behind why it got banned. I don't know that it's necessarily the same reasons that we're thinking of it, sure. <laughs> thinking that it's great today. Sure. I'm, not, I'm not necessarily saying that, but I'm just saying like, it, it wasn't like, um, I don't know, what's the most frivolous comedy that would come out today like that you would never think would would have any meaning later. Like it's, I, yeah. don't, I don't think it was seen as that. A remake of The Importance of Being Earnest or something. <laughs> yeah. And things I hate about you. Well, yeah. So I wanted, I have two points to that. I It, it was banned because I think they thought it was more morbid. And and I think the, the free love aspect, that's from what I read. Mm -hmm. I think the, those elements made it um, distasteful in French culture. But to, to Alicia's point where she's talking about it, it wasn't anti-Semitic on purpose. It was just, there was just elements of anti-Semitism with in throughout the entire film. And I think that in itself is telling about the moment in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. There were some other moments where, you know, they, they was talking about Negroes or about, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, Arabs and Muslims. So like, I feel like it was just sort of like a casual racism that they had mm -hmm. and it was just mm -hmm. part of like their class. So like, I, yeah. like you, I didn't really think it was, necessarily tied to the war, but. I think it was also a way to make the Count and his wife out sort of outsiders, which I think maybe we already mentioned that, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, as people that didn't understand the rules of the game that they were supposed to be playing their little That's love good games point. or whatever. Yeah, I you like can thank you Bogdanovich did. for that point <laughs> or whoever. Okay. <laughs> Take the win. It was Bogdanovich, by the way. I, I forgot to say, I looked it up and it, he did do the commentary. Okay, but, okay. Yeah. It was good. Yeah. Um, so related to the Satyat Ray quote I cited earlier, um, I feel like we're kind of already touching on this, but do you think the subtlety of the film does make it harder to recognize its innovations and importance with modern eye? And by that, I'm, I'm not, I don't mean just like the stuff we're talking about in terms of story, but some of the craft elements of it using uh, deep focus, um, cinematography, uh, depth of field and things like that, where, you know, the staging was just very m much more advanced than a lot of other things at the time. And and it's something that we also talked about with movie that came out just, what, two years later, Citizen Kane. Like, I feel like this is sort of a, a thought of similarly in that regard to Citizen Kane and a couple other movies of really pushing things forward in, in terms of those aspects of filmmaking. But I think it's so much more subtle in this movie than in a movie like Citizen Kane that it's easy to miss and just sort of like take in the story and not notice that that's happening. So what what is everybody's thoughts on the subtlety of those innovations as Ray kind of called it? I think when I watched the hunting scene, I, I thought there was a lot of interesting stuff happening, but for the most part, I was just taken in by the story and the characters and um, the over the top behaviors by everyone and mm -hmm. motivations. So yes, I missed it. And I would like to go back and listen to Peter be wax poetic about the film. Cause he, he is such a film fan or used to be, yep. I, I would like to hear those comments. Steven. 
Yeah, I, I think about the scenes where I think it was sort of near the end when the gun play happened and it was during, you know, the performances that they had and then like all the action was happening around all the rooms. And just thinking about the achievement that it took to go around and all the action is happening, even though it might be focused on two people, you see stuff happen in the background and then they move into that room and then mm -hmm. things are happening here and then they are happening here. And that, I guess, wasn't one of those cases in those days for movies were kind of made like that. So yeah. just the fact that I didn't notice it was actually kind of interesting. And when I watched the second time, it really did hit me that this was really an achievement. And I think that that's kind of what some of the movies we've watched are like, we were so used to seeing stuff like that, that we kind of missed the achievement with that. But yeah, that was pretty spectacular when I watched it again and thought about that. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, Very good I point. Thought, oh, sorry. Um, I thought that also all that stuff was really well done and, and obviously like a big technological achievement to like stage all that, all of that action and follow it. And I thought it was also, it was sad to hear that, I guess the original print or, I'm not sure if it was the original something got destroyed during World War II. Yeah. And I would love to have seen like it without some of the cuts and some of the scenes that you can tell were kind of like placed back in later. But I thought it was really well done technologically. Well, I, I think I read a couple of different things, but most of what I saw seemed to point to the, what we've seen is pretty close to what was put out by uh, Renoir at first there's there's one scene that he said was missing after he saw the restored cut that he said wasn't a very important scene and, and it didn't really matter I, but I think otherwise the restoration they they found pieces of negative and other uh, uh, duplicates of the film that they were able to piece together and make something approximating pretty closely the the original. I don't think it's a case like uh, like we talked about with our first movie that we talked about, uh, uh, Passion of Joan of Arc, where they had to basically find other takes because the original mm -hmm. takes were lost. I think they had the stuff and just had to really work to piece it together. There was an interesting story in the um, commentary. <laughs> Sorry to keep bringing it back to that, but it really did. It, I did find it very helpful. Um, the scene where Christine is using the like binocular type of device mm -hmm. to watch the squirrel that apparently supposedly that whole thing was not improvised, but they incorporated that into the story like on the day because they wanted to find a way for her to find out about what was going on, but they didn't really have a story. They didn't really have a device for that yet. And this guy, one of the actors brought that little device with him that day mm -hmm. and they decided to use that i thought that was really cool too like if i were like the director of film and some actor randomly brought something onto set i would have never like been like oh my gosh that's like you know light bulb moment right <laughs> i thought that was really cool that's funny because like the line i guess because i i pointed that out when i was i just thought it was an interesting thing when he looked when she looked through it and he said oh you can look and not disturb what's going on mm -hmm. and then it just happens that they see that so i don't know if they wrote that for it or you yeah. know after they did that so that was really that's really interesting because it, it yeah. fits so well with what they were already doing mm -hmm. i know yeah i like that yeah i wonder if it's true it's a great story either way <laughs> like i thought to demonstrate the director's you know brilliance if you will right what did you guys think of the quote from the beginning? Sensitive hearts, faithful hearts who shun love, whither it does range, cease to be so bitter. Is it a crime to change? If Cupid was given wings, was it not to flitter? What did you make of it? <laughs> <laughs> I liked it, but I liked the whole film. Right before that, don't they have a disclaimer about like, yeah, this isn't real people. Like, I, I, I thought it was almost like the opposite of like the Fargo thing of uh mm. it, it seemed a little pointed of like hey don't blame us we're not basing this on anything real so don't get too mad well i mean that's just to say you know they do that so they don't get in trouble i know they do that now i'm not sure that was standard then <laughs> uh yeah. maybe it was but it, it and it's not usually like right before the movie starts mm. maybe they had some test screenings and then they're like yeah we should put this in maybe i don't know maybe <laughs> My notes are very um, negative. 
why the weird dolls? Why do I have to watch these animals being killed? <laughs> I can't tell any of the men apart. What, are, no, what does yeah. anyone like about Christine? Everyone's hair looks like shit. <laughs> How come no one can take off a bear skin costume? Lots of racist stuff. <laughs> wow. Those are so supposed to be funny. Wow. <laughs> it's very clumsy, melodramatic. I'm the only sober person at the bar. Yeah, it just gets, it's, that's, I didn't wow. like the, I didn't like, I, I mean, that was on my sober first person <laughs> at the bar. Wow. That's I'm how I felt. Alicia, do you, have <laughs> you ever like, do you like Moliere or any of those kind of, I don't think I've ever of seen... those are plays. Yeah, um, I know, but I don't think I've ever seen a Moliere play it, honestly. They're ridiculous. So one thing is that the movie, as I said at, at the top, has been on the critics list every time in the top 10 since they started doing this every 10 years. And it's been on the director's list once. It wasn't on it the first time they did it. It was on it the second time, then not the third. Um, so I've always had sort of this like ongoing developing theory that certain movies that are more appeal to writers more and critics largely are writers often, not always, but often. And I wonder if there's something there about this movie, because I think it's more of like a literary kind of tale than something that is immediately cinematic in the way that like Citizen Kane mm -hmm. is like on the surface of it. It's like, mm -hmm. it's subtle, like we've been saying a little bit. Um, so I wonder if it's more a critics movie than a, a filmmakers movie in, in some ways. And that doesn't mean that no filmmakers like this, obviously plenty do. And it's right. But for it to be every time in the top 10 of the critics poll and not there as much in the directors. I just, I, I wondered about that. I think that's a really interesting point, but, and to maybe the exception to prove the rule of someone like Robert Altman, mm -hmm. which this, it seems like this kind of film informed his entire oeuvre yeah. and um, everything he does from it. So, yeah. yeah. But yeah. I, I would argue though, that I think Altman has more, kind of for lack of a better word like cinematic flair than reward oh, does because like he's always got those zooms going on the yes absolutely. the overlapping dialogue is done in a way where it's like kind of more in your face like th it's not as subtle I, I think the his his fascination with ensembles I think obviously stems from this or or movies like this or a similar fascination to Renoir or whatever you want to call it but I, th I think he does have a different spin to it. Well, to the, uh, when we talked about how there's multiple things happening within the scene from the forefront and the back, and mm -hmm. there's all these different movements and characters and, and the lens captures it all. That's what I was thinking about. But sure. yes, I, I, I don't agree with you. I, I was just thinking I, when you said that, I would actually have been interested to read this and as a novelization. I think it would have given... A lot more insight or have, would have the potential to give a lot more insight into everybody's inner world or what people thought the rules that everyone should be following were and the way really stuck on the broken. rules but it's called the rules of the game <laughs> and it's and it is supposed to be that there are people they're they're treating their like affairs as a game and mm -hmm. you're supposed to try to still maintain this like out outer layer of good behavior or something and they there are st some characters that aren't able to do that and then Christine tries to start playing the game when she sees her husband and the and his mistress and then she like is so bad at it that someone dies at the end. <laughs> so I do think the like game and its rules are kind of important to understanding and and this the stuff that's going on that you're supposed to be able to invest in and I couldn't so Anyway, Steven was going to say something and then Laura. Oh, the only thing I wanted to add is that I, I feel like when I saw it the second time, I just noticed how strong the dialogue was just because I was reading it. And I'm wondering what it would it have been the same if I had just heard them acting it out just because I felt like some of the dialogue was just kind of powerful between a lot of the characters. So that's why I wondered if some of the critics did enjoy it more because they were reading it rather than just hearing it. That was just like my my question, because mm -hmm. I mean, some of them weren't French, obviously, so. I just wanted to bring up the timeline. I Christine knew about the the affair even before. I I don't think the binocular scene is is what oh, showed no. her. I, I don't know about that. <laughs> well, 
You don't, you disagree? Yeah, I don't think she did. Okay, because the next day when she said, have I ever given you a hard time about your affair? She was prying, she was coming in to like try to get information out of her about it and confirm that it was really like a long-term affair. I don't think she actually knew. I think she was like fishing for information and she was pretending to play their game and be like, yeah, of course I know. I'm not bothered at all. And what do you think about when he does this and that? And I don't think she did know beforehand because at the end of the movie, she comes out, she's having that scene with Octave and Lisette. And she's like, everybody knew about this for three years. You knew that my marriage was a lie and nobody told me. Mm, That's interesting. Alicia, I have to think about that. Mm -hmm. I thought the same thing when she had mentioned like, oh, do you notice the ashes on the sheets and all that stuff? And then they were both laughing about it, but she didn't seem really that happy about it. Mm-hmm. when that had happened so i think she was not a, also not a very good actor like i just didn't get a sense of what anyone why people were like so passionately in love with this woman i don't know i just she didn't have a lot of charisma for me so i think maybe that's also a reason that it was hard to know what did she know or not you know yeah i mean i could understand that i don't think she's like burning up the screen or anything i didn't have a problem with her necessarily but you're not the first like i read a couple of reviews afterwards where i i saw her performance called out so i I don't think you're alone in thinking that by any means i thought she was very garbo-esque see i don't think she was doing anything close to what garbo could do with her face (laughs) you know i think there's a similar there's like a looks similarity thing there but i just think garbo's face is like so expressive and I just didn't see that in this in this actress. I, I feel really bad to say that about anyone because I know everyone's like trying their best, but I just think it was not a successful. She didn't do a good job right. for me. What did you think of Lisette? I thought she was um, she was a little bit more broad, but, you know, she definitely kind of was more emotional about everything. And maybe it was just because her story was just a much more emotional type in your face story, but. Yeah, I liked the set. I thought I thought she was good. I thought I thought everybody else was pretty good. I just didn't. I just thought that it, maybe it was a mistake to cast her as the sort of central. Although I understand they wanted someone who was an Austrian and or whatever. I just think it, it could have cast a different Austrian actress to play the part. But um, yeah, but I liked every. I liked. I didn't like Marceau. I didn't like a lot of the characters. I didn't love Marceau's physical humor stuff. But I didn't. I didn't think like on an acting level that anyone else was like doing a bad job. Okay. So how about we take one more break and then we'll come back, share our final thoughts on the film and get into our bonus questions and all that stuff. And we're back. So what was everyone's favorite scene or moment or some other element of the movie? And not to keep harping on you, Alicia, but since you were the one who liked the movie the least, is there something you can point to as as an element that you did like? I was trying to think of something before this, and I was like, I can't even think of any scene that I liked. Um, I guess I liked the binoculars thing that I brought up earlier. And I thought, I do think it's impressive. Like I said, I think the staging and everything is, is technically impressive, but... Um, So I guess that's like the element that I liked the most. Okay. Steven, how about you? Um, I liked, uh, I think it was one of, during one of the dance sequences when everybody was watching um, the performances and there was like a spotlight and it was moving throughout some of the rooms for the couples that were kind of, you know, agonizing over different things and just the movement of that. And just seeing like, you kind of felt like what everybody was going through at different moments, but it was moving so fast that you kind of got a, a better sense of, you know, just the grandeur of what the scene was going to be about rather than just like focusing on this person and going here, you kind of had the movement, which I really liked. Right. Laura. The morning when all of the people woke up and found their shoes missing the men and they all came together in that, that scene sequence and played Mm -hmm. with each other and communicated Mm -hmm. that way. I thought that was really fun. The ending scene when spoiler alert, I won't get too specific, but the, when the three women hold hands and, um, Christina is like what people are watching. So they had to show no emotion. So I thought that was an interesting moment. The hunting scene was long and it was brutal and interesting. It was very watership down, but actual murder. (laughs) Yeah, that That whole scene, 
that whole scene was just really interesting to me just because they're like, oh, we're hunting, but they weren't really hunting. They, they were just like, shooting that's at what stuff. They did. Yeah. yeah. And it yeah. was just, it was just funny that like, that's an upper crust thing to do apparently is like, oh, we're going hunting. Yeah, totally. And they're all in like really nice mm-hmm. clothes and they're just shooting rabbits, which are being knocked to them. Yeah. So, yeah. That is um, how rich, wealthy people hunt. <laughs> yeah. The, I mean, that part now is going to always make me think of Succession, which I'm not sure if anyone else on this podcast is watching that show, but I just watched the first episode of the first season. Okay. That's all I can. Well, there, there, there is a hunting trip at one point, um, uh, and they are also barely hunting, if hunting at all. But anyway, <laughs> um, I'm kind of, I think in a similar boat to Steven in terms of what my favorite part was, I liked both the movement that he brought to certain scenes, but then the kind of stillness and, and uh, reliance on that deep focus and depth of field and others. I thought it was interesting to watch his choices about when he used each of those. And it always seemed like the right decision, which you know, he was, he was a great filmmaker, so it's not that surprising. But um, I, I just like watching for that sort of stuff, especially when it's something I know is kind of praised about a, a movie anyway. It's like easy to kind of pay attention to it on a on a subsequent watch if you've seen it before. Yeah. So has the movie, as far as you are concerned, stood the test of time? Do you think it resonates today? Steven, do you want to start us off? I think it does resonate because I feel like there's always going to be classes of rich people and not so rich people and working class people. And the people make bad decisions every day. And some rich people or upper class people pretend that things don't matter to them when they do, but they just need to keep things up for appearances. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's kind of a universal story that will always carry forward. And then also just the filmmaking itself. I mean, just looking at how the, the technical achievements of it and just the story. So I, I feel like it does. It, it's definitely kind of an older story just because it was made you know, a while back, but I just feel like it's still a universal theme. Right. Alicia? No and no. I think that there is a lot of interesting stuff in there, um, but I think it's like, the for me, it's just the prime example of it's been done better later a lot. And, um, and I think that, that the subtleties are too subtle. The, the intricacies of French society <laughs> right before the war, in between the two wars, it, it just uh, is too subtle for me, too intricate for me. Mm-hmm. I think, yeah, it just didn't, didn't, doesn't resonate with me. And Laura? I think yes to everything that Stephen said, um, but then the surprisingly lack of empathy of the rich and upper classes, I think is definitely something that resonates today. Okay. Yeah. I'm kind of torn on this question. I, I I think like of the movies we've watched so far, maybe this one stands the test of time the least, even though I really enjoy it. I think it's maybe the hardest one for an average moviegoer to connect with, I would guess. Um, just because it, it does seem so specific to the time and place it was made in so many ways. That said, I think that if you're willing to kind of go there, there is plenty to pull out and examine and connect with. And I do think that the fact that it's been so influential as sort of like this template of upstairs, downstairs, class depiction proves that it's important. But I... Uh, I don't know. I always struggle with this question and what the fuck it means, honestly. Uh, uh, I should have wrote this question differently, huh? Um, Alicia, you're going to say something. I just wanted to say, like, I'm glad Stephen brought up the masquerade scene because I had kind of forgotten about that. The scene with the um, where they do the dance macabre mm-hmm. and the spotlight is it, I thought that was actually like really, really eerie. Right. In light of the timing and everything that happened after it, it, it really did make me think of like the Germans mm. shining their spotlights down on people in the street to see what they were doing and try to capture them. And, you know, I, I it was that was that was really prescient <laughs> of, of him. If that's what he was really trying to right. accomplish there, then that was like a stroke of genius, if not psychic ability. <laughs> Okay. 
So uh, how about we move on to our bonus question? What is a film that you didn't initially like, but you enjoyed or loved it after revisiting it several years later? And Stephen, do you want to start us off again? Um, sure. I actually, it's funny when I watch a movie and if I don't like it, I don't watch it again. Mm -hmm. So it was really hard for me to find one that I actually did watch again. And it's unfortunate, but it was Austin Powers, the first one, because I saw it in the theater <laughs> and I was just like, this movie's awful. And I could barely sit through it. And then I saw it maybe like two years later and I thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. So that's the only thing I could think of that it, I couldn't think of anything higher brow than that, because there's certain movies I'm like, I'm not watching that again. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and Laura I only could think of the reverse <laughs> um, and just like John Hughes movies and 16 Candles and how much I enjoyed it and loved it and and then watched it again and was horrified by a lot of it and like and sort of what inspired the beginning what I why I rewatched Leon was for the same reasons to see how I would take it. And, and it, yeah, I, I, I can't think of a positive one to answer your question, but I'm going to keep, keep, th keep on noodling it and uh, <laughs> try and come up with something, if, even if it's at a later podcast. Okay. And Alicia. Yeah. I'm, I think sad to say <laughs> this is embarrassing, <laughs> but like the first time I saw Pulp Fiction, I was just like, what is going on? <laughs> I was like 16 in my defense. It was like, I had never seen anything like that before. And um, I just was like, I, there, it's violent. And, you know, I was a very sort of girly type of girl sometimes. But, um, but yeah, but then I saw it again when I was like in my early 20s or maybe even in college and um, really liked it. Just was like, what? what was I thinking before? Like, how did I not recognize what was going on here before? Now someone's banging on my wall. Oh, that's you so. now? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, funny. I thought that was me. That's hilarious. Cause I was like, wow. what? Okay. even though this was my question, I'm not sure I have a good example of a movie that like I loved after seeing it again years later, but I'm just going to say Michael Clayton which I mentioned when I rewatched it earlier in doing this podcast. Like the first time I watched that movie, I just thought it was stupid. I just did not get it. I didn't like it. I didn't enjoy it. And then when I rewatched it recently, after it's, I feel like become a very hyped movie, especially among critics and like film people, I definitely liked it a lot more. I, I, I don't know if I'd go so far as to say I, I love it, but it, it, I definitely missed something in it the first time and was almost like embarrassed by how off the mark I was in my assessment previously. Um, it's a good movie. It's a really, it's an entertaining, enjoyable movie, um, suspenseful and all that. And yeah, so I'm going to go with that just because it's recency bias, if nothing else. Just curious what everyone else thinks of Michael Clayton. Cause I, I never saw it. Oh, it's excellent. Also Jeremiah, just... you should watch it again. Maybe you'll love it next time. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I definitely liked it a lot uh, after rewatching it. And, but yeah, anyway. All right. And we also had some really good answers in the Facebook group. Uh, Rebecca said, I saw The Big Lebowski for the first time on my 16th birthday at a friend's house. I remember being in a terrible mood and I hated the movie. Watched it again 13 years later and really ended up enjoying it. And then Marta said the Royal Tenenbaums. Michelle agreed with that and said, me too. I think because I loved Rushmore so much and my expectations were so high, when I saw it in the theater, I somehow felt slightly underwhelmed, but I've actually grown to like it more with each viewing. And uh, Marta then agreed and said, it's, it's got great one-liners. Um, and then let's see, Marie said Anchorman. JPK said, our previous guest, JPK, by the way, they go back and check out the Searchers episode. Um, he said, I think the first time I saw Breakfast at Tiffany's, I didn't understand many things about life. Now I enjoy the movie much more, but hate Mickey Rooney, which they just cut him out of the film. So there you go. And Charlie said, this is hard. I usually don't rewatch things I don't like. On top of this, movies I rewatch, I tend to end up liking less, not more. 
The first thing that comes to mind is Moonlight. I didn't like it when I first saw it. When I watched it again, I appreciated it more, but it's still not a film I like very much. So sort of answers the question. And uh, let's see. I, I, I'll also just throw in that I, th I thought of another one <laughs> that is actually a better answer for me, than, although Michael Clayton, I think, was still worth discussing. But The Exorcist is the best illustration of this to me. The first time I saw that uh, was on VHS at home with some friends when I was in high school, and I thought it was so bad, like laughably bad. And then I saw it again in the theater when the director's cut came out when I was in college, and I thought it was amazing. So I don't know if it was the audience experience or the uh, what they added for the director's cut or what, but just I enjoyed it so much more. So our next episode is Mia's fourth pick. It is Persona, directed by Ingmar Bergman and released in 1966. It's available to stream with a subscription on the Criterion channel or on HBO Max. It is also available to rent via Apple or Amazon. So that's it for this episode of the Stereoact Movie Club. We invite you to join us in our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Stereoact Movie Club. You can also email us at stereoactivemovieclub at gmail.com. This podcast is produced by Stereoactive Media.